uh, Masayuki Yumura, uh, Yumura, I'm terrible with Japanese names, uh, the creator of the NES and SNES passed away, mm. um, which was, you know, like the man was 78, so he lived a, a full life. You can't, you know, uh, it's it's sad, but hey, it's a celebration as well. And I just thought I would take a moment to uh, to kind of see like y- you guys, and obviously this is the link to the, the cast podcast. We celebrate um, older games, older consoles, and I just wanted to see you know what your memories or experiences with the the NES or the the SNES were. Mm. Um, so Peter, I'll, I'll jump over to you first. I mean, like for me, they were like absolutely foundational. Like you know, they like uh, I. When I was growing up, I, you know, video games were such a huge source of comfort for me. And um, they were the thing that I was most interested in. Like, I, without a doubt, like, I, there's stories of me being like three years old and playing uh, like a Binatone TV6 game system, uh, playing Pong on a, you know, kind of like a Pong clone, basically. Um, and when my friend, a friend of mine at the time, got a, he had a NES and, um, and he had some games on it and and it was just i just it, it was it was absolutely mind blowing to me to go from something like pong uh to to uh to super mario brothers for example um and i have some of my fondest memories from and my earliest memories i should say maybe not my fondest memories but some of my earliest memories uh were like being a child and being in front of a like you know not even a massive tv but like a you know a cathode ray tube tv so deep when you're a child when you're, any tv is yeah, a big oh, tv yeah it was probably like you know 12 inches or something like that but it was it was giant right and you always um, had to sit like really when you're a kid you just loved sitting close to a tv you right? had to be close to it otherwise how could you get all the pixels into your eyes exactly um, <laughs> And, um, you know, I'd wake up at like six o'clock in the morning and I would go and play Super Mario Brothers and Kung Fu and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And, you know, I'd, I'd go and play all these games on my on my NES before I went to school. And um, it was uh, funnily enough, the NES was like the first console that I ever got bought for myself. I got it, but I, I didn't have any for a really long time. And then like I got that and an Atari 2600 at the same time. Like my God. I was like, oh, my goodness me. Now, I will caveat this. I went into a Woolworths with my mum. And she said, well, which of the systems do you want? Do you want this one here um, or do you want this one down here? And the one that she was pointing up to up here, she said, do you want this one? And I said, I don't want that one, the one on the bottom. I was like, I don't want that one. I don't know what that one is. I want that one. My friend Please tell me it was one. like a Jaguar or something. Uh, it was a Super Nintendo. Oh, uh, okay. So I got a NES instead of a Super Nintendo and basically just at the edge of them oh, stopping no. to make games for it. So like... <laughs> So, like, my knowledge of video games up until I was about 14 was NES. Oh, wow. And, like, that was, like, maybe five years after the NES had gone, right? Like, yeah. So, like, so then making that jump afterwards, like, uh, to, to, to kind of play around with that stuff um, from a personal experience was, like, again, hugely foundational. But, again, like, Super Nintendo, like, I will never not, like, if I hear, like, you know, level 1-1 one, one from Super Mario World, like it's just it's just it's just ingrained into me right like it's just you know a friend of mine had that i would just go there ignore him play the super nintendo you know the the um the that kind of um that kind of haunting chip sound of star fox uh, or star wing as we had it yeah, yeah. um like yeah like absolutely foundational and those things basically were the things that I love from the very very beginning and and obviously now you know I I you know I, I'm able to buy fancy expensive craft beers with it and stuff like that cuz you know I, I get to make money off of it but yeah I think it's absolutely foundational without those consoles oh, I don't know I we don't know what probably, I would have done. we probably wouldn't be talking well I mean maybe we would I don't know like <sighs> The the thing with the NES obviously is after the 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 video game crash of was it nine eighty five I believe it was uh, um, it was like yeah it was I want to say it was eighty three because the eighty five was when the NES came out that's when the NES came out yes yeah. yes yeah pretty a couple of years earlier so it's it's hard to say what would have happened but it does go without saying that like the NES its popularity the original Mario Bros like they are foundational to us getting to the point where we are at now. You know, um, like I the mean, master system is great, but oh, I don't yeah. know how many. Brilliant. Like, and I and I love Alex Kidd, but I don't think that carries the same weight. I think the thing you know? is, I think the thing is, 
it's funny when you go beyond the NES, when you go to the uh, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, you are playing games that you kind of get to a point where you're like, I don't really recognize. You have to think really hard about their lineage to to the modern day, right? Like like when you go to the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, you're like, I don't. Like there's a few like maybe like adventure, but you have to really abstract out where that goes. Like to to like well, you have adventure and you're moving a pixel around a screen and finding a key. So maybe you could call that like a you know uh, you know you could maybe relate that to an element of one of the games these days. But when you go to the NES, you start to see like oh this is the foundation of like third person action games. Yeah, you got platformers, you got beat 'em ups. You got everything, right? You've yeah. got so much stuff on that on that system. And then when you go to the Super Nintendo, that's the point where like you're starting to see, you know, uh the developers move away from arcade like experiences more towards things that they, they were like, well, we're going to make this because this is going to be in the home rather than like, we're going to put ice climbers onto the NES or we're going to put Popeye onto the NES because it was, you know, successful in the arcades. Um, yeah, like you go back to the NES and you can see like Legend of Zelda, right? Like think about the number of games that just just wholesale rip whole ideas out of that. And probably, probably the developers don't even know about it, right? Like yeah. just so yeah. many ideas in there. Like... Things like live counters, timers for things like uh, in, in in Super Mario Brothers, for example, like timers to get you to, the, to keep you moving along. Like, is it the original Zelda that has the first save file? I don't know if it's the first save file. It might be one I, of the I earliest feel like it ones did on some, console. I feel like it did something that was the first. I know it was a save file was, or something else. I mean, but... like, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Excite Bike was like one of the first ever track editors where you could make your own tracks for the. Yeah. For the for the for the for for each race, it was it was genuinely incredible. Um, yeah, absolutely formational. I, I want to bring Jack in because, like, for me, the, the the relationship that I have with Jack, like, I've known him for Jesus, what we're going on, uh, 15, 16, 17 years, somewhere up there. I actually think it's and more. So I think we were like it, fourteen. Um, so I it, I think this might be the twentieth year that we would Jesus have known each my other. Mate. God, yeah, but. A lot of my, uh, like, gaming memories with Jack are all based around the N64. Like, you know, we have lost many, many hours to your your Mario Tennises, your your Mario Kart 64s. But I don't really, like, or at least I don't remember if we've ever spoken about what kind of uh, experiences you had when it came to, like, the NES and the SNES. I just, for me, it's like, it's that generation of the PS1 and the N64, and then it's anything afterwards. But I don't remember anything before when it comes to you. So I'm really curious to know, like, what your experiences were. No, I mean, it's weird. I think when I grew up, my my parents, neither of them uh, had any interest in exposing me to the world of video games, right? Um, I, I was quite a smart kid um, from an early age, and I think my parents were very much like, if he's not going to ask about video games, we're not going to tell him that they exist. <laughs> you know, we're not going to give him like this this portal into this world. And it wasn't until about like 94, 95 that my brother, who um, actually had moved over to Israel, funnily enough, of all places, and, and lived over in Israel for sort of like four or five years. So he kind of wasn't around as I was getting older, like to the point where I could, you know, actually have conversations and stuff in a childish way even um when i was like maybe five or six or the ages that people might start like looking at and touching and having contact with video games um and he brought me back a game boy from israel and it changed my life like he was like ah you know i i I haven't seen my little brother in like three or four years um and i was like i think it was like eight and he's like right what do i get him you know i'm just gonna get him a game boy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> obviously and it was a great decision because yeah um i don't think my mom was initially too thrilled and uh, my dad was like yeah i'm not sure about this and then when i showed him uh tetris for the first time then yeah uh, i was fighting him for the game boy because he would be playing <laughs> tetris as well <laughs> and it's funny when it came to like console gaming i jumped in at that playstation that n64 era so all of my like knowledge and and interactions with anything super NES or NES before has come solely through 
ROMs really for the first sure. time and playing yeah. them on 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 computer. Like the first time I played Super Mario Kart, I was playing Super Mario Kart with like a probably I think a PlayStation Three controller or whatever plugged into a laptop um, and playing through that game and didn't actually have the same sort of tactile yeah. emotional experience with the cartridges and the the console and stuff that everyone else had so it's to me it's it's kind of like it's like going back and discovering like i don't know the the, the back catalog of like the bowie or like the who or queen or something where you're not really around well you were around but you're not really in the time interacting with the thing you kind of go back and learn and to me like how influential like the super mario brothers games were on the nes or super mario world and yoshi's island on on, on super nes to me i'm playing like six golden coins uh, and super mario world like on the, on the game boy and those are my entries into super mario so when i when i like finally get around to playing these games on on nes and super nes i'm like oh like i really really like this um because it reminds me of those things but then those things only existed because of the games that that were there pre Previously on the NES and the Super NES, like you know, my first interaction with Zelda would have been like um, Ocarina of Time on, on the N sixty four, and it's not until you sort of go back and you play it like a Link to the Past and that that you you get like what it was. My first time I played Final Fantasy VI was on PlayStation um, when they like remastered and brought it out. Um, yeah. I didn't get to play it on its on on the Super Nintendo when that came out and stuff like that. So. I, I like a lot of the games and I really, you know, like I, I, I've played through a lot of them and really enjoy all of them, but I don't know if fraud is the right, right word probably, but like, I don't feel because I didn't have that same experience at the time. It's like, I can only ever enjoy it through the filter of, of somebody like years later discovering these things for the first time. And I love doing that with music. I love doing it with film. And I, I feel exactly the same way about video games, like any multimedia experience. I always feel like going back or whatever it, you can still get the same mm. the same emotional responses or whatever but maybe when it comes to this like just listening to like what peter's saying he's got the whole thing of like he's in walrus with his mum and stuff first of all just the walrus reference immediately know, just right, right. <laughs> i didn't even getting... know they sold co- uh, consoles oh, in mate, they sold fucking everything in yeah, walrus. Was... I, I realize this now yeah, yeah like you pick up you pick up a video game system go and get your pick a mix yeah and then uh, a bag of compost and then yeah yeah exactly you you, buy, you can <laughs> you can buy a potted plant some cola bottles and like soup and wave race like in the same How place did they ever go out of business honestly oh uh, just terrible terrible direction or leadership but uh a few people that i work with now had worked at Woolworths and told me the absolutely shambolic decision making that was going on in that company but yeah they, they, you know the uk high street is another conversation but i i love a lot of those games but i don't think i'll ever because those emotional bonds weren't formed at that time and that age around that time when it came out i don't think i'll ever feel as passionately emotionally like Mm. i can artistically appreciate how good a lot of those things are and play through them and realize how much i i really like them but you know there's something to be said about forming an emotional bond in a period of time with something when you're around with it like like the music you're listening to when you're like 15 16 or whatever that kind of seeps into your soul will always be that for you and you can get into stuff that's like older and get into stuff like when you're you're older and there's new music coming out but there's something to be said for connecting it with it at that specific time and yeah I, i'm very sad to say i don't have that with the nes or the nes but I, what i do have is i have the uh the the mini nes and the mini snares that i bought for myself when they came out <laughs> and I they sit it. pride of place in my bedroom with all my other video game consoles so uh yeah it's a, a very important piece of history but i'd be a fraud if i told you that i had this whole host of time relevant experience with them the the one thing I wanted to to say is that with the the SNES, I feel like that was the first, and you could include the the, the Mega Drive as well. Mm. That for me was the first generation where you had a, a group of games that genuinely felt timeless. Yeah, yeah. Um, there may have been you know a couple here and there when it comes to like the the NES and whatnot, but you know if you go back and play the original uh, Super Mario Brothers. 
Mario is just a little bit too floaty. You can't scroll. You can't go back. It's, you know, he feels heavy. Like, I was playing the um, the the Mario Brothers, like, Battle Royale from, was it last year or the year before? And I found it quite a struggle to play. Super Mario 35. And it's a struggle to play because just the physics of Mario just... <laughs> It feels like a game that's kind of, you know, from 1985. Mm. But Super Mario World, you got picked up tomorrow. And it's, you, you, could, you could give that to somebody who's never heard of Mario and say, this is the latest indie platformer. And they go, all right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like whether it's, whether it's that, um, whether it's Link to the Past, which for me is, is just one of the kind of earliest examples of like a timeless classic because to some degree, pretty much every Zelda game since has kind of used the form, up until Breath of the Wild, has used the formula of Link to the Past. I guess Link Between Worlds kind of mixed it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> Please don't talk about Skyward Sword again. <laughs> no, no one. Um, and so it's for me, like the thing that I think about is, is just that that kind of period of like those games that I played that I play then and I play now and... There, there doesn't feel like there's been any kind of span of time in between. They feel as playable then as they do now. Obviously, not all of them do. Star Fox it's a bit rough does feel a now. bit janky in 2021, yeah. you know, but I hear that Corneria music and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Corneria, that's a timeless piece of music, I'll say that much. Um, Can we shout out Donkey Kong Country 2, by the way? Oh, I mean, Donkey Kong Country in general as well. It was the, t- it was um, the two that I really liked, though. Like I really like the second one. I played the first one for a little bit, but the two and again, it's another thing that I formed a relationship with on Game Boy, and then only ever played the 3D version on console. And then I went back and played like Donkey Kong Country Two, and I was like, this game fucking rocks, man. Mm, like, it big- does. And I think I think also the other thing with this is that there's definitely this period of time where the Super Nintendo feels like the the, the first time where you could make the game you wanted to make and not be limited by the hardware. Like, you could... Like obviously, there were hardware, hardware limitations, but if you go back and you play, you know, uh, A Link to the Past, for example, you could simply see that as a choice of pixel art, right? Like, mm. you, you, go, you go and look at it and you're like, this looks great, Right, like you go and play some of those Kirby games on Super Nintendo, they oh, look great. Beautiful, still. yeah. Right, and like, and like, obviously there were some games that were a bit rough around the edges, you know, because uh, uh, they were trying to push into technologically advanced areas that the Super Nintendo really just could not handle. Look, Mode Seven is really impressive. I wouldn't say it's the best looking thing, I but it serves its purpose. But I think that the Mode Seven stuff is the stuff that's the least timeless. Like, yeah. I think I think the stuff that really tries to, um, that like, you know, and especially the Super FX chip stuff as well, actually. The Super FX chip stuff is really like, okay, this is impressive, but, like, yeah, come on. Um, but, yeah, like, you're absolutely right. The, the Mode 7 stuff is a little bit like, you, you look at it and you're like, yeah, okay, I, I can see how you're faking this. Whereas with the pixel art stuff, the top-down pixel art stuff that makes very light use of Mode 7, um, that's the stuff where you're like, I, you could bung this on a handheld and be like, yeah, this is a brand new game or, you know, like, and indeed that is what people did for a really long time, right? Like that basically kept the GBA's library going, like Super Nintendo games like yeah. uh, and, and, and ports and so forth. Like, yeah, I just, it's just that period of time where you're absolutely right. You can't see, you can't see like the cracks. There's no... There's nothing holding those games back when they're when they're working within their own technical limitations. Whereas you look at the NES and you're like, like I love Double Dragon, uh, like absolutely love Double Dragon, but you can tell that that's an old game. You can tell that that game is like a bit stiff and a bit clunky, and you know it's got only a small number of color palettes that you can have on screen at one time. Whereas you go and look at the next Double Dragon on the Super Nintendo, which is garbage, but it does actually look like a good game right it actually like it it it, it keeps it keeps that level up I would yeah say. yeah <sighs> well nice one umahara um, yeah and yeah, uh, yeah. I t- you I, did well Uma, umara umara i can't I'm, I'm just as bad as you are isn't that terrible umara um, i think it's umara, umara. Um, i'll tell yeah. you what here's here's the last thing and this is something that's going to really worry you What's it going to be like? What is the internet going to be like? I already know what you're going to say. When Miyamoto goes. Yeah. (laughs) Jesus. I'm going to be legit gutted. Yeah. Like, like, that will be a day. 
and like well wishes to that man let him live forever if any of us deserve it he deserves to live forever but oh that's gonna be a rough day mm. yeah, and we're getting the, there. On that. the one that really hurt me this year was um the final fantasy composer nobu or mm. imatsu um, right. there's a game that came out called Fantasian, right? So some of the sort of like team of like the late nineties, uh, final fantasies that, that worked on it. And he did a bit of work on the game, but then apparently like had to scale back. Cause I heard that like, he, there was some ill health situation going and just hearing that Nobuo Uematsu might be sick. Just like my heart was like on the verge of stuff. I was like, no, you can't take this absolute creative genius away from us. At this but we're point. getting to that point. Yeah. Like, we're getting to that point where our heroes, yeah. like, like, you know, they're, they're getting older and it's, it's, it, you know, this is the like the games industry has never really had to worry about this because it's such a young industry. It's such a young industry, yeah. 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 And it's just like, oh man, like, oh, this is tough. Yep. I know but they're, they're still going to be stuck with David Cage for a while. Yeah, they're so. all going to like the big cartridge farm, aren't they? Like they're they're not going to pass away. Yeah. They're just go- they're going to live on a farm where they can frolic with pixels <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and and Yoshi's and 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 Kirby's and stuff. Right. Yeah. That, that's yeah. what's going to happen. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. 